Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Exchanging Ideas 53 Global 5G Evolution. I'm Kaneshwaran Gwendasami, the founder of Global 5G Evolution. A warm welcome to the speakers around the world. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your presence. Uh, to the audience, please take a couple of seconds to click the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. Um, we will have a Q&A towards the end of the session. It will be a fantastic uh, brainstorming among the well-versed technology inclined experts around the world. Uh, the question is, given the rapid advancements in AI and network technologies, what do you see as the most exciting developments or challenges on the horizon for AI-enabled networks? Um, so to the audience, please do not forget to, to see the end of, of the session uh, of the Q&A. Now, when it comes to 5G applications in the electricity industry, China Mobile is uh, forefront in this case. Um, I took uh, the privilege for you to make some analyze of this presentation by China Mobile. Now, China has incorporated the development of digital economy and digital technologies into its national strategy. And the National Development and Reform Commission, uh, Ministry of Industry and Information Technology, Ministry of Transport and other ministries and commissions have released no, numerous favorable policies to support the 5G development. 5G applications have been integrated into 87 national economic categories, extending to major industries such as electric power, transportation, and manufacturing. Now, if we look this slide, 5G is leading the world in digital and intelligent transformation. 5G application is key industry includes 5G smart mining, 5G smart power, deep cooperation has been established with power generation and grid enterprises. 5G smart factories with China's top 10 home appliance corporation. Uh, 5G smart ports, including China's top 10 container ports. And uh, 5G smart metallurgy, which is the A plus steel companies. The smart education, smart auto drive, smart healthcare, smart parks, smart shipping and smart railways and smart logistics. Uh, if the audience wants to know the details of it, please do contact me. I can give some detailed analysis on, on of these use cases. Now, when it comes to China Mobile, is laying out a great cap innovation, uh, demonstrating the city to accelerate a large scale commercial applications of red cap technology. 5G dedicated network applications across different industries, including the Asian Games Security Visual Network Project in Hangzhou the HYC Smart Factory project in Suzhou, uh, and also the Mingdi Port Smart Ocean Platform, Mingdi, and Lihuli Hospital in Ningbo, uh, uh, and Urban Management Bureau's Full Cycle Sanitation Supervisation project in Shenzhen as well. Now, China Mobile's 5G Plus Smart Power leverages 5G tech to build a dedicated network that meets the specific needs of electric power enterprises. And by integrating 5G with existing power infrastructure, the solution enables a range of smart applications, including plant monitoring, distribution network automation, intelligent inspection, advanced metering, and power remote command as well. And this contributes uh, to smart dual carbon initiative. Now, if you look this like China Mobile's uh, One Power Smart Power sub-platform offers a comprehensive solution for managing and optimizing power communication networks and by providing key capabilities such as network connection management, equipment and slice management, the sub-platform enables various 5G smart power applications including the intelligent operation and inspection, distribution network automation and advanced metering. It also integrates with other platforms to provide a holistic solution for power grid management improving efficiency, reliability, and overall performance. This image outlines a typical application scenarios of 5G smart power solutions across the power grid uh, from gener generation to consumption, and it highlights the use of 5G in various areas such as intelligent inspection, uh, distribution network control, and advanced metering. This image emphasizes the potential benefits of 5G smart power 
um, improve efficiency, reliability, and sustainability, as well as integration of smart energy solutions across different power grid components. Now, China Mobile's 5G Plus distribution network differential protection solution utilizes a 5G dedicated network and hard slicing technology to provide a low latency and high security services for differential protection and it enables real-time monitoring and current value interaction and comparison results between nodes at both ends of the distribution line, allowing the quick identification and response to any problems. And the solution offers a high precision timing, um, network metrics such as low latency, high bandwidth and reliability, and ensures a secure communication through dedicated slices, particularly in the network monitoring. Now, if you look in this slide, it illustrates a use case for China Mobile's 5G distribution network, differential protection solution applied to the China Southern power grid. And by utilizing 5G, the solution enables efficient communication between devices and the power grid, reducing power outage duration and ensuring accurate fault detection. And the 5G network architecture featuring business slicing ensures secure and efficient data transmission as well. Uh, China Mobile's 5G Plus, uh, this is, uh, they call it the Distribution Network Automation Tally Solution. And it utilizes a 5G technology to connect distribution network equipment to a control master station, uh, enabling data communication, telemetry reporting, and remote control. And the solution offers low latency, high bandwidth, reliability, and security through dedicated slices and network monitoring. Uh, test results demonstrate its effectiveness in me meeting the business needs of 5G plus distribution automation uh, for remote services. Now, China Mobile's 5G plus robot inspection, another case study, utilizes 5G tech robots and advanced sensors to replace manual inspections in the power industry. Uh, by leveraging AI image recognition and high precision positioning, the solution enables robot to perform intelligent unmanned inspection tasks improving uh, efficiency and accuracy. And the solution includes features such as AI visual recognition, infrared temperature measurement, uh, autonomous inspection, and accident warning, providing a comprehensive inspection capabilities for the power grid. Uh, China's Mobile's 5G Plus UAV inspection, uh, the solution utilizes, uh, utilizes 5G technology to integrate UAV with power applications, uh, providing efficient support for providers system construction, operation and maintenance. And this solution leverages 5G real-time communication, um, high performance UAVs uh, and unmanned inspection capabilities to enable detailed inspection of power equipment, uh, reduce labor costs and support rapid deployment for remote power stations. Additionally, 5G UAV intelligent inspection um, platform offers a comprehensive management capabilities, include uh, route planning, operations, results management, and equipment main maintenance. And lastly, uh, 5G for improved power grid management. Uh, this solution leverages 5G slicing, uh, communication connection management, and IP management to enable the power grid operation and maintenance. By implementing 5G smart grid uh, applications like uh, helps realize the visualization, uh, standardization, and refinement of uh, wireless communications. Uh, and additionally, the solution supports real-time monitoring, end-to-end -end ordering, and provisioning capabilities meeting the differentiated needs of power customers. So I think this is my presentation overall. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, let me uh, introduce our next speaker. Uh, just one second. I would like to introduce uh, Sneha Singh from Sydney, Australia to present on the private 5G for outdoor purposes. What do you say? Thanks, Ganesh. Uh, let me share my screen. Is my screen visible now? Yes. OK, great. Um, so as Ganesh said, my topic for today is private 5G for outside broadcast. Uh, have you ever watched a live sports event or a concert on your television and wondered how 
real time high quality videos transmitted from some remote outdoor location to millions of ears worldwide so this topic is going to tell us a, a little bit more about uh, on how this actually takes place in the real world and um, just to introduce myself, I'm Sneha Singh. Uh, I'm Senior Solutions Manager at a company in Australia, Sydney. And today we will see how private 5G can play a vital role in the outside broadcast industry. Okay. Um, is my next slide visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, great. So before we begin, what exactly is outside broadcasting? So outside broadcasting or outdoor broadcasting as they call it, it involves transmitting live audio and video feeds from locations outside of a traditional studio environment. It is used for covering live events like sports, concerts, music festivals, political events, and even live news coverage. The industry includes a wide range of activities, um, right from small scale live reporting to large scale event coverage, requiring multiple cameras, mobile units, and extensive technical setups. So while tuning into a favorite sports events live from our televisions is quite easy, there's a lot that actually goes into the live broadcasting of these events. So let's have a look at what are the key components of what goes into setting up a live broadcast setup? So the first component is uh, the outside broadcast van or the OB van as they call it. It can be a truck or a van. These are usually mobile production units equipped with the necessary technology for mixing, editing and transmitting live footage right from the field. So as you can see from the first image on the left, the inside of an OB van or a truck consists of camera control unit, uh, which are devices used to control various parameters of the cameras, such as color, balance, exposure, and focus, video production switcher, which is equipment for switching among different video sources during live broadcasts. And then there's audio mixer, which is equipment for mixing and controlling audio from various sources. This can include microphones, ambient sound, and many other audio inputs. There are video monitors for the crew members to monitor different video feeds, preview graphics, and ensure that the overall production quality is good enough. And there's quite a bit of other technology equipment and servers that goes uh, into this uh, OB van. Then there are satellite uplinks and fiber links. These are used to transmit signals from these outside broadcast vans to the remote production center or to the control room, which ensures that the live content reaches audiences in real time. So in the second picture on this slide, you can see an OB van fitted with a satellite dish. So it's transmitting a live satellite feed. And then there are cameras and other audio equipment, which usually includes high definition cameras, microphones, and other recording devices that are deployed across the event site to capture live footage, often under challenging environmental conditions. For example, it could be a mountain bike race that the camera guy is trying to capture. So the image on the right over here just shows a camera operator working on ca capturing live footage uh, from a football match at uh, Wembley Stadium. Yeah, as I um, was talking earlier, so the setup required for capturing and transmitting the live footage of events is not easy, and there are a number of challenges that the outside broadcast industry faces today. So one of these challenges is that there are quite a few different technologies that the broadcasters use today for different types of events and for different types of feeds. So for example, uh, they use fiber. Fiber can provide a lot of bandwidth and lower latency than wireless technologies. However, all the cabling can become really challenging as as well as expensive and difficult terrain. Not to mention that a fiber doesn't really allow the mobility and flexibility that wireless technologies or mobile technologies can enable. As you can see in the figure on the left-hand side, in this case, the cameras are wired to the outside broadcast van or to the OB van. So it doesn't really enable a lot of flexibility and movement, especially for events where there are mobile vehicles, fiber can become really, really challenging to work with. Then there's another technology called COFDM or or COFDM, it's short for Coded Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing, which is widely used for transmitting video feeds from wireless cameras. As you can see in 
the image on the right. So these are uh, people or cameramen on the bikes trying to capture live footage of an event going on. But this technology also has its limitations. So at least in Australia, we're observing that the number of concurrent feeds transmitted or the video quality is limited due to the spectrum bandwidth that's available for transmitting uh, Coftum feeds in the two gigahertz band. And we have seen that the local outside broadcasters are very much interested in bringing high capacity on the venues. So some of these broadcasters also use public 4G and 5G networks, and uh, which are usually provided from the mobile network operators for tr wirelessly transmitting videos, audio, as well as telemetry data. However, we know that uh, network congestion is a problem with um, public networks, especially in crowded areas where there's a live event going on, and the variable performance levels can cause issues during live broadcasting. So to give you an example of um, a major racing car event in Australia, they currently use Coftum for transmitting video feeds, they use UHF for audio, they use IP connectivity for driver communications and other bits and pieces. They also use public carriers sometimes for the live broadcasting of audio, and there are multiple disparate technologies and multiple service providers for these different technologies, making the whole project quite complicated and cumbersome. Some of the other challenges that the outside broadcast industry faces is bandwidth limitations. So in Australia, the spectrum allocated for this industry, which is usually in the two gigahertz band and the seven gigahertz band has limited channel bandwidths available. That makes it harder to accommodate multiple 4K videos or let's say transmit a high number of HD video streams simultaneously. Also, the Spectrum Authority in Australia has begun a transition period where outdoor broadcasters are being asked to cease operating in the 2 gigahertz band to make space for mobile satellite services. This is making Spectrum access a bigger challenge for these outdoor broadcasters, and this is motivating them to look for alternative spectrum for live broadcasting. Another challenge that they face is setting up and maintaining the necessary infrastructure in outdoor settings, because this can be a resource intensive task and can be quite complex logistically, so often requires advanced planning and significant investment. So now um, that we've seen some of the challenges and we move on to seeing how private 5G is suitable for this industry. Uh, I'm guessing most of you already know what is private 5G, but we can just have a brief overview of what private 5G exactly is. So private 5G network is a dedicated wireless network designed and implemented exclusively for an enterprise or an organization. This offers the enterprise more control, more opportunity for customization and flexibility flexibility as compared to public 5G networks. So what makes private 5G so special, right? The private 5G is deployed on license spectrum that is exclusively reserved for enterprise usage. Quite a few countries have made either dedicated or shared spectrum available for private use. For example, CBRS in the US and shared and 77 spectrum in the UK and many more countries. Private 5G uses dedicated network infrastructure, so often deployed on site for private use. The different deployment models that service providers are using today, but a fully on-premise model uses network elements that are exclusively used for that enterprise customer, unlike an operator where everyone is on the same shared core. Private 5G also provides higher quality of service than a public 5G network, uh, mainly because the QS can be customized as per the customer's use case requirements and the network performance can be supported with insured SLAs. And above all, private 5G networks provide data sovereignty or privacy because the data can be processed at the customer site itself. It also provides higher security since only the customer provision SIMs can latch onto that particular private network. Um, also, private 5G network have quite a few advantages, especially over public 5G or Wi-Fi networks. So, for example, when it comes to coverage, mobile network operators usually have good 5G coverage in outdoor and metro regions, but not in rural remote areas, especially in large countries like Australia, where there aren't too many people in the rural and remote areas. So it becomes too expensive for them to deploy a site. Private networks can be used to provide coverage in such underserved locations. When it comes to reliability, Public 5G and Wi-Fi networks can suffer from poor capacity or performance. Private networks ensure enterprises have dedicated capacity and often have redundancy built into the design. 
then uh, there's mobility. So we know that fixed wire networks don't enable mobility, but even Wi-Fi networks that do allow mobility have limitations in terms of what quality of service they can enable and what latencies they can achieve, especially for mobility use cases. So as a result of these advantages, you might have already seen that private 5G is being used in a variety of industry verticals. Uh, just to name a few, there are, there's manufacturing, then there's transport and logistics, utilities, and the outside broadcast industry too. So um, in the previous slide, we saw what challenges the OB industry is facing and private 5G is quickly emerging as a promising solution since it can help tackle quite a few of these challenges that we saw earlier, especially when compared to older technologies or public networks. So how is private 5G changing the game for live broadcasting? The outside broadcast industry is quite special in the sense that they use uplink much more than they use downlink. They're constantly uploading live videos, audio, and data to their remote production center or to the OB vans. So this is where private 5G shines. It, it provides better uplink throughput than public 5G networks, which are often congested. And they're also configured to support um, more downlink throughput than uplink throughput. In contrast, a private 5G network can be customized with special DDD downlink uplink configuration to support higher uplink throughput. This means broadcasters can transmit high definition videos and audio with much ease, making it ideal for live broadcasting. Also, low latency is quite crucial for live broadcasting. And we already know that 5G can support low latency, which enables real-time communication between the remote event locations and the studio or the van. Then there's mobility. We know 5G supports more than 300 kilometers per hour. And um, also private 5G systems are being designed for the OB industry in such a way that setting up ad hoc or temporary broadcasting stations for special events is not labor intensive and cumbersome. So it enables broadcasters to extend their reach to remote locations where wired infrastructure is So it helps save time and resources when compared to traditional wired setups. Um, so yeah, that just is last already, couple of slides. The ten minutes already over. Okay, okay. I'll quickly wrap this up. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so this is what an end-to-end -end live broadcasting solution with private 5G could look like. So for example, if this was a golfing event, the broadcaster can deploy a trailer on a cell on wheels or on a trailer with 5G radios on board. These radios will provide coverage to the entire event location. The cameras will have 5G modems so that they can essentially act like UEs and transmit the videos directly to the 5G radio. Then there's a private 5G core that can be even set up uh, in a multi-server stack right in that uh, OB van itself. And the videos and the audios are tra transmitted from the 5G cameras at the event location to the OB van, which then transmits the feeds via the internet to the remote production center. And that is where the final program is produced and then distributed to the audience. And these are just a couple of examples of how private 5G deployments are being deployed around the world. Uh, in these settings. So that first example that you see is of, a, of the King's coronation ceremony. And I think it was a Scottish company called Neutral Wireless that deployed a private 5G standalone network. Um, they used about 80 megahertz of bandwidth in the N77 shared spectrum. And uh, this uh, their network was actually used by BBC's uh, live radio coverage of the event. And uh, it provided connectivity for the remote or uh, temporary recording studios. And the next one that you see is from uh, Paris 2024 Olympics, where mobile phones and a private 5G network were used to stream live footage from the opening ceremony. And this was the first time an Olympic Games uh, opening ceremony had taken place outside a stadium. So this was really helpful in terms of using smartphones and a private 5G network to provide live footage of that event. Um, yeah, that's it from me. Thank you for listening. I hope now you know how private 5G networks are making a difference in the outside broadcasting world. That was a brilliant presentation. Thank you, Sneha. I really appreciate you. Uh, now, moving on to the next speaker, let me introduce uh, Larissa Tufiano from Bucharest, Romania, to present on the UAV-assisted IoT applications in 5G NTN networks. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ganesh, for the introduction. Let me just quickly share my screen. Is my presentation visible? 
Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending this session. My name is Larissa Tufano. I'm a PhD student at Polytechnica University of Science and Technology from Bucharest, Romania. I'm specializing in telecommunications, mobile services, and cloud infrastructure, mostly on 5G and 6G transmissions. And today I will be discussing the IoT applications um, in my research facilitated by this uh, UAV-based 5G transmission within the non-terrestrial, so NTN networks. Uh, within NTN, we are looking at uh, seamless integration of satellite and uh, aerial networks that will extend the connectivity beyond the traditional terrestrial systems that we already know, enabling UAVs to support multiple or various IoT use cases across multiple industries as well. This integration is actually essential for the application in the remote or otherwise hard to reach areas where let's say traditional 5G networks have little to no coverage. So there is a specific limitation. And we will take some of the most important IoT applications and try to delve together into more details for each of them. Okay, let's begin with uh, precision agriculture, where UAVs are, uh, let's say, revolutionizing the farming practices. So the UAV is equipped with uh, alti uh, either multispectral or hyperspectral imaging systems. And they are capable of capturing high resolution data on crop health, on soil moisture levels, on growth patterns. And these sensors that are combined with LIDAR, which is coming from light detection and raging, which is a remote sensing method used to examine the surface of the earth. And combined with these sensors, it will be able to provide a more detailed 3D model of the field allowing for, let's say, fine grain resource management in the farm. What 5G NTN brings into, into this is that it enables the ultra reliable low latency communication. So the URLLC that we know between the UAV and the ground control system, even if it's a rural or an isolated location. The bandwidth provided by uh, millimeter wave technology will also allow for large volumes or real data uh, that is transmitted from these UAVs to either edge or cloud computing systems for instant analysis. And the current research at the moment focuses on, uh, of course, on AI-based predictive analytics where this, where these deep learning models can be used to analyze the crop data for, of course, early detection or to, or, or to identify diseases or even pest infestations in the field. Uh, we can also use Massive MIMO, of course, uh, which uh, has been studied to enhance UAVs to ground station connectivity, of course, particularly in large farming areas where signal interference can be a, a big issue. Uh, there is also energy efficient UAV designs like solar powered UAVs that are a hot research to, to enable long duration and also autonomous operations over these extensive fields. Uh, moving on to another IoT application, we can also discuss about disaster management and emergency response because UAVs are indispensable due to their ability to rapidly deploy uh, or to be deployed in hazardous environments. Uh, they are now integrated with a lot of things like thermal cameras that lead that technology or in, even infrared sensors, which will allow them to locate survivors under the debris or detect heat signatures or map devastated areas with extreme precision. And these UAVs uh, can also be equipped with AI-driven obstacle avoidance that are some algorithms that can be used to navigate through dangerous environments autonomously. And the role of 5G NTN here is critical, especially in environments where terrestrial networks are failing or they have limitations. We can use advanced beamforming techniques in satellite communications to ensure that we have a low latency link between the UAV and the ground-based emergency teams. And we could also use a hybrid approach, approach with the satellite and UAV constellation that um, is also a hot topic in the research because it would be able to provide a more resilient communication channel during these uh, disasters. And uh, another trend is uh, also the UAV swarm technology, 
where uh, what does this mean? It means that we have multiple UAVs that work together collaboratively. And this is made possible by using multi-access edge computing, so MMC, which enables the processing of vast amounts of sensor data in real time that is, of course, distributed across multiple nodes that work together. And this helps reduce latency significantly and allows this uh, UAV swarm to dynamically adjust their flight paths and areas of focus during these uh, rescue operations. We also have uh, another application that is called environmental monitoring, where UAVs are equipped with uh, multi-sensor arrays, so they can range from uh, air quality detectors to thermal sensors. They can gather data on pollution, on temperature, on humidity, on uh, biodiversity even. Uh, UAVs that are, that are powered by 5G NTN uh, can relay real-time data to other monitoring stations that are performing instantaneous analysis, even in remote locations like, let's say, forests, oceans, or mountain ranges. And the key aspect here is to be able to provide edge computing that will allow the UAV to process this environmental data locally and thus reducing the amount of information that is sent back over the network. And this is critical when using 5G and 1 millimeter wave for high speed and for low latency as the most essential data needs to be sent. So we are optimizing the bandwidth usage. Current research is uh, focused on hybrid UAV systems so that they utilize renewable energy sources to allow for longer missions or to reduce the need for manual intervention. And here is where AI and machine learning, ML, are actually going to be applied to the environmental data collected as they will enable these predictive models that we are uh, focusing on that can even forecast pollution trends or be able to identify at risk wildlife populations. Another IoT application is the supply chain and logistics. As UAVs are not only revolutionizing delivery, but also the management of assets in real time. So that means they can be equipped with different GPS, IoT sensors, RFID, and they can automat autonomously and automatically navigate and track goods through every stage of the supply chain. And here it is what's interesting because we can combine these technologies with blockchain uh, that uh, allows us to transfer data between UAVs and the supply chain in a more secure and a temper-proof way. And this reliability of the UAV operations that uh, hinges over the 5G and TN uh, URLC capabilities will be able to provide us with a low latency communication, a better one between the UAV and the cloud-based logistic platform. And we will be able to make some adjustments that are made in real time for delivery routes or inventory updates. And of course, if we take into consideration again, the artificial intelligence, then AI-based algorithms can also help to route and optimize then this, uh, these routes actively also being researched to minimize energy consumption and to, to ensure timely delivery, especially, of course, again, in remote or uh, disaster-proof uh, areas. Okay. Uh, of course, we, we need to have uh, an application that is called telemedicine. And uh, UAVs play, of course, a critical role in this one as well as they deliver critical medical supplies to hand to reach areas. They can be integrated with IoT enabled medical devices that can allow healthcare providers to remotely monitor patient health or even to deliver emergency care via real time video and data transmissions that are facilitated by 5G NTN networks. And the latency sensitive nature of healthcare demands this URLC capabilities that we, we have in 5G NTN. We can also use edge computing uh, as to enable immediate processing of the patient's data, even before it's transmitted, ensured, ensuring that this time critical information is prioritized in the correct way. And uh, there is also AI powered diagnostics that is uh, currently a hot topic in the research. 
So this AI-powered diagnostics is basically the UAV that is equipped with health monitoring sensors and that can analyze the patient data in real time. And there's also active development in the UAV-based 3D printing technologies that could also be used to manufacture different medical supplies on demand in remote areas during emergencies, which is something uh, extremely important. So going, uh, going on from telemedicine, let's go to smart city applications where UAVs are being deployed for real-time monitoring of infrastructure, not only telemedicine, but here we can talk about traffic or public safety. That means these UAVs can utilize high resolution cameras or different IoT sensors or even AI-based image recognition systems to be able to detect anomalies, accidents, traffic congestions, uh, different structural defects in bridges or in buildings. And this 5G NTN uh, provides the high throughput and low latency connection that is needed to transmit this data to urban control centers, where of course immediate action can be taken with the help of again, edge computing that enables that processing uh, on, um, on stop. And with the help of AI-driven predictive analytics, uh, we will be able to enable the smart city managers to forecast different traffic patterns to detect infrastructure stress even before it becomes critical. And of course, contribute as most as possible to optimize the urban resource management. And here, if we draw a comparison with the previous slides, we could also use the UAV swarm technology where multiple drones collaborate to monitor larger areas for more efficiency. Uh, then we have the energy sector. The time is over, so would you mind quickly wrap up? Yes, I will quickly wrap up. Thank you for the reminder. We have the energy sector where we use UAVs to inspect and monitor infrastructure such as power lines or pipelines and offshore wind farms. And we also have, lastly, the maritime and offshore applications that are used for the inspection of offshore oil rings, wind farms, and other maritime infrastructures. They are also critical for uh, search and rescue missions at sea, and they utilize thermal imaging, radar, and IoT sensors to detect and track objects in vast ocean areas. So as you can see, there are a lot of IoT applications that are being enabled and driven by this 5G NTN networks that we, we are taking into consideration. That is all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larissa. I really appreciate great presentation, colorful slides, uh, very well articulated. Thank you so much. Now, let me introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Antti Pinoma from Lapin Ranta, Finland, to present on community hosted private 5G networks for sustainable digital transformation in Global South. Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, can can you give me a right to share? I did. Okay. Uh, which screen you can see? No, oh, that's wrong. Larissa, no. have you uh, stopped screen sharing? Yes, just a moment. Yeah, all right. I need to share this one here. Yeah. And then, no. <clears throat> uh, just, I need to, I have multiple screens. I need to adapt just a moment. Sorry, this is now some hassle, but maybe we will get there. Uh, can you see my screen now? No. Nope. And now? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Okay. I'll see you now. Sorry. Sorry for the hassle. Come on. Two minutes. Oh, shit. I'm sorry. No, okay. So, uh, good day, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Antti Pinama. 
<clears throat> I'm I'm uh, associate professor in electrical engineering at at uh, LUT University, uh, Lappeenranta, Finland, uh, and I have my background in in research in in smart energy systems, smart uh, smart grids, and those ICT uh, systems. Recently, also with with uh, mob wireless mobile networks, including five G. I'm also uh, LUT University representative in in five uh, G. Uh, 6G Co Finland coalition, where we are uh, working on on giving contribution to the standard standardization and coming up with with different use cases. Uh, then, uh, since 2018, I have been running a uh, uh, research theme in 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 the rural electrification and and digitalization in developing markets markets more precisely in in Africa. And and there, as a as an outcome of of one research project, then we see the potential there, and then we come up uh, with <clears throat> with a startup company as a as a spin off from the research called uh, Karukrit O Limited, and we are now doing business in in uh, developing this uh, electricity connectivity digital services in a package solution that we believe will help. Uh, developing or remote communities uh, and to increase those livelihood and 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 make 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 those flour flourish uh, so my uh, title community hosted private 5g networks for sustainable digital transformation in global south is like combination of both research in academia and then our experiences in doing business in this field so i think we all know uh, so where we are with 5G. So in industrial count industrialized countries, we have we have still going on search for use cases, business models and the killer apps uh, for 5G and then in future for 6G in different verticals, industry, infrastructure, energy, you name it, as also was in the previous uh, presentations. And then one big thing in, in 5G is sustainability. So how to how to reach it. So energy efficiency is big uh Hot topic, but how to how to have it in in distributed computing solutions when when you have more smaller cells and you need to maneuver uh, through the improved efficiency, increased complexity, and and then also the data amounts and data processing power are increasing. Then there are business models. Of course, we need to work on those, uh, and those needs to be ad adapted to. To, to the real world challenges and needs uh, and, and the use cases. So this is the success then global standardization is one thing. So it's just like outlining the, the context we are here. And then one, one thing, at least in Finland, we are facing uh, challenges is that where we can find the future talents and we need multidisciplinary approaches for education and training to get these new, new experts in the field of new technologies, radios, AI, machine learning, cybersecurity, etc. And then we are thinking about those uh, those challenges, which is, of course, very needed. But then at the same time, in, in uh, developing countries, there are still uh, 1 billion people without access to electricity and then 3 billion uh, people without internet access. So and, and many of those are young people and, and then they don't have like equal or well uh, education uh, opp opportunities for good ed education. So there are many uh, still suffering from missing or poor power and connectivity, which we are taking the granted. So power electricity comes from the socket. It's always available and then we have good internet access. But this is not the, not the case for, for many still. And what we know is that having Having this infrastructure, electricity, and connectivity, those are the basic foundation for modern life. And if you don't have it, it holds back the econ economic development is what, what is very evident in Global South, which is generally left behind. And the blocking point, why? what is the case here is, is I would say, is the uh, uh, large utilities and, and telcos, they are their business cases are pretty much the traditional ones and, and there's no point, for instance, build heavy infrastructure to reach 
all the uh, all the uh, communities living remotely and then for instance africa is very vast uh, continent <clears throat> but then then we see that there's business opportunity so but then the question is how to provide access uh, access to these sites to this case where there are a lot of challenges so the customers are poor of the poorest and then we are aiming to to go to hard hard to reach areas where there are no infrastructure but then again there are these sustainable development goals as drivers so we need to foster equality diversity inclusion and then we have 5g uh, which target is global access and and now in 5g through decentralization and and that's that's called cloud computing so having this global access means that there are local access points and networks everywhere so could this 5g then and be uh and this like edge cloud computing uh networks be the solution so what we are facing here is is that there's no existing viable business model to reach the unconnected but our hypothesis is that that power and internet let's give power and internet to the people through standalone private networks and and then again but why this is still undone i think the main reason is that that it it needs like localization so every local region has its different unique requirements in a sense so those needs to be understand identify and then generalize those uh, and then 5g and 6g is now going also uh, in a way uh, at least partly in wrong, di wrong direction so the small cells uh, the cell sizes are are getting smaller uh, but then again we would need reach uh, for these uh, uh, remote areas where people are sparsely populated so how to connect these with with these solutions and we, we believe that while waiting the 5g deployments and uh, end devices to become more affordable uh, we should start with private LTE networks which are there available and then the end, end devices are there also with with uh, I would say uh, affordable price point uh, then then also what is needed here we need to get get uh, the frequency licenses for the in these regions but this this could be uh, some cats for the MNOs if we bring their better reach uh, so new new customers and 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 also they they are aiming doing uh, doing uh, uh, good things so so better reach with lower costs th that I think we can do with the private networks and the, then what is the backhaul connectivity is, is then the private mobile networks bundled with satellite which is now heavily going in uh, becoming more common in Africa and then there are uh, entities and ISPs building fiber networks to the schools for instance so those could be used as a backhaul connectivity and then we could get the impact even even higher than just providing uh, internet access to the school and education of course which is important but we can do much more and everything is then powered with off-grid solar solar power so solar is is very freely available you just need the uh, panels and and inverters and those costs due to the high volumes is, is decreasing though so there is solution and then also solution that pro promotes sustainability so what we have been working on recently is, is social isp so based on the experience we have ha we have got from african telco regulators and regulations so the idea is to liberate the use of of 5G PP technology for closing the digital divide. Uh, we need to have bold enough solution to get the governments involved and decision makers. Uh, and But then the idea is that we only use private LTE or 5G data access networks for providing this coverage where it's needed. So schools, remote communities, etc. Affordable internet connections can be provided uh, through prepaid and pay as you go seams and data bundles and then the locally uh, there needs to be locally run and get cached contents and services in 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 those uh, uh, private network uh, local core servers 
So we need to reduce the dependency on internet because it, it still is fluctuating, but it shouldn't stop us, us doing the uh, pro providing uh, access to digital contents and information even run locally. Uh, so I th we think that economically this is viable way to connect the next billion people not still not connected. And we have also been endorsed by IEEE and USAID just recently in the end of last, last year on, on our uh, social ISP concept. And then what is social ISP uh, is that it's, it needs to be easy to run uh, and user installable uh, base station, for instance, so for everyday living uh, environment. So we are providing solution here for the, for the layman. Uh, and but then if, as we have the access, we can provide uh, remote support from uh, from uh, remotely and also training. And this is the way to decrease the operation and management costs, which, which are the things that that uh, take down whatever business model or, or idea you have. So you need to take pay attention to those concept elements is that in the package there would go smartphones, smartphones and MiFi boxes so we we get rid of the handling the the sim cards so sim cards only go to the MiFi boxes lt is the last mile also for local contents and and iot so we need to take care of the power system as well backhaul as i mentioned satellite or fiber and then smart off grid solar is the way to power the networks devices and local services and then when scaling up and over dimension the solar system we can introduce more business models there and productive use of electricity seems. So for not just education, but also businesses of so agriculture, cold storage, aggregation, irrigation, very needed. And, and this is something we are working at the moment besides the providing the connectivity. So the full package. Uh, and then a few slides left. So education, uh, that's our, our use case. So uh, digitalization of education is high on the agenda, also the topic of this uh, this uh, presentation, and and then schools are already in the center of the of the remote communities, so good place to have the have the the, the uh, base station and private network base, and and then having as I mentioned have these synergies on electricity, so productive use seems get those involved, provide energy kiosks, charging phones, etc. have IT class, whatever, you name it based on the need, easy to, easy to do. And then uh, this local server being there, so we don't need to have this all the time, uh, high speed internet connectivity there, which is, the, which is the fact, we need to adapt to that. And then the idea is to have these multi-purpose hubs here and there. So they are locally run digital services and the education material for young to become and train them to the workforce of future and also to answer this to this demand that we need new talents also in 5G, 6G and software engineering and whatsoever, AI, you name it. Uh, so and those could be trained them to be workforce working remotely from anywhere. So not not new concept, but we we could really scale this up, and so uh, we prof. believe this, this is the sorry, source prof. and of digital transformation. So sorry, I have one more slide. So this is what we want to would like to see. So there is this like bubble networks uh, in ser serving the communities, and then we have internet with any transport and through which we can provide the support and remote management, and what we believe this is the cost efficient radio access which we can we we can transform digitally the, the lives of, of people and young living in, in developing countries. And here's my contact details in the end. So happy to share ideas and talk about these things later on as well. So thank you. Thank you, Prof. That was really great. Uh, very informative. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Let me introduce our next speaker, Tanku. Razman Othman from Singapore to present on 5G broadcast. Over to you, Tanku. Thanks. Um, can you guys see the screen now? Yes. Okay, good. Let me start. Um, I'm in Singapore here working with Caton Technology. So we are focused on the IP transport of the broadcast industry 
So now we deep dive into the 5G broadcast uh, ecosystem. Um, I guess Senia did mention about uh, Paris just now. So same picture <laughs> uh, about uh, what has been going on in the 5G in broadcast and media. So internationally, we see that Euro 2040 is used uh, 5G for broadcast and also the IoT. And recently Paris, we see also the uh, opening ceremony because it's outdoor um, uh, venue. And recently in, in Malaysia also, the National Day, it's used 5G to capture uh, the 22 kilometer as their studio. Uh, so it's outdoor studio for, for um, the National Day. Okay. So 5G has different uh, spectrum and also different use case. Some can be used in the stadium uh, for vehicle, which is on mobile. We have uh, environment for smart city, transport, and also smart energy. So it can go across multiple industry, okay? So for 5G, there are new uh, broadcast standard that is coming and also been developed, um, release 16 and release 18. There are more enhancement on the 5G broadcast uh, coming forward. Okay. So if we choose one slice, which is for media, uh, it uses a lot of uh, 5G features, uh, almost 80% from slicing, the mobile edge, the RAN security, um, uh, traffic steering, and also quality of service. So it used a lot of 5G um, features in order to deliver the media content. So if we look into uh, media content, it does have nine category from uh, medical, uh, interactive media for education. And currently we are doing live streaming uh, for education or even for live production. And now, we have a lot of user generated, uh, individual blogging and all the, um, how to say, uh, end user instead of just a professional uh, production. And also we have um, IoT machine generated content and we have VR, AR in, in the communication. When you deal with sports nowadays, you have, uh, I will say virtual advertisement overlap with the current uh, game, for example. And of course, the legacy is the professional content is still uh, valid in, in the uh, media entertainment uh, industry. And also smart education, uh, it's also getting uh, traction, which use media as part of the delivery. And when we come to 5G, the higher UHD content will be used and the CDN will be inside the 5G network instead of in the data center. Okay. So what do we share with the infra provider? So this is a recent um, report that we uh, gather. So 60% are now using cellular as their mainstream um, transport because there's a lot of outdoor um, event going on nowadays. Um, Olympic is one of the big uh, example where they have venue is on the river Rhine. You cannot run cable uh, to get the connectivity on the boat, for example. So 5G is taking the broadcast uh, around 74% of the traffic um, has used 5G now. And AI is making an impact for the um, broadcast industry, either from the content side, from the virtual um, assistant referee or virtual um, advertisement, okay? And we also seen that why the IP technology now is, is growing, um, bandwidth. I think that's what a lot of uh, broadcaster uh, need, higher bandwidth and lower lat latency. 
uh, visibility to go around uh, area that is not fiber ready cost. I guess with 5G, there will be cost saving versus a lease line or a fiber uh, or even a satellite. And reliability is also key uh, to get this content uh, clean and high quality. Okay. So we have seen that there's a lot of news agency are using 5G now. Um, for example, during the UK election, every election point, you have a phone capturing the result. And then they can go live to uh, uh, either a director station or even social media. So this has been used in, in many, many international use case nowadays. Okay. So example um, for sports, um, we, can, we need low latency and multiple camera. Um, to get high bandwidth. Uh, if it's from a phone, for example, if you're using high-end phone, you can stream 15 meg. So if you have a 5G uh, modem with encoder, you can go 50 meg. And all this is one of the uh, requirement to have high quality content sending to other uh, professional uh, broadcaster. Okay. And we also see that in the IP um, transformation, um, AI and ML is now become one of the highest technology to be adopted. Uh, that is around 60%. And we see the second one is 5G, uh, around 57%. So it's very close to uh, the AI ML use case that we heard every day nowadays. Okay. And, and one of the um, important traffic when we do video, we don't want to have hiccups or the end user experience need to be similar. So one of the technology that we focus is on the traffic steering, splitting, um, um, which is one of this uh, reference. It combined the 5G, Wi-Fi, or even satellite to choose best network seamless handover and aggregate so the end user is maintained with high quality you will not see pixel or blank screen during a live event okay. and with the ai we see that there's a lot of data that have captured in the network so how to utilize that data so from let's say uh, continent wise from singapore to us the routing need to be uh, managed properly so that when there is a disturbance, congestion, um, the route is changed before the uh, issue appears. So this is what the AI smart routing can do in the, uh, not just in the data center to data center, but also between the 5G network. Okay. So last but not least, um, all this 5G, you can download from this um, uh, website is by the government in Malaysia and standard that shows how to start the 5G POC. And it clearly put in the picture of how the evolution of the 5G broadcast uh, have moved forward. Okay. And last but not least, I just want to mention, I've been in the OB van, and it's what, what Sena mentioned, is a lot of high tech inside there. And it is where the broadcast for outdoor or out, um, I would say outside broadcast is, is being captured. So that's all for, for me. Thanks. Oh, thank you, Razman. That was a brilliant presentation. Uh, very informative, really appreciate uh, thank you so much. Now, let me introduce Ulf Sejmers from Stockholm, Sweden, to present on testing 5G in the forest to control forestry equipment, both via public and private 5G. Over to you. Thank you very much. So my name is Ulf Seymer, and I am the chief innovation officer at a company called Induo, uh, but I also work uh, for a company called Accurate, where I'm the CTO. 
And as well, I'm the dragon head of the EU Tech Technology Council that was formerly the IoT Alliance. So uh, my history with 5G is that in 2012, I had the honor of writing an article on 5G, exploring what it would be and why it would be important. So 12 years ago, I predicted that 5G would become an intelligent technology capable of connecting the world without boundaries. I also envisioned that 5G would be a technology that would be available everywhere and seamlessly connect everything. So, so much for the vision. In reality, 5G is available in many places, at least where I live, but there are still areas that remain more challenging. So we're going to visit one of these areas today. One of the challenging areas in my country, at least, is the forest. So approximately 69% of our land area is covered by forests. So forestry is a significant industry. And one of the projects that I've been involved in, we investigated the usage of remote controlled forwarders in the forest. And the project was set up by the Forestry Research Institute of Sweden. They're called Skogforsk and uh, put that name in the back of your head because I'm going to mention it a few times further down the road. So first of all, what is a forwarder? Well, a forwarder is a piece of heavy machinery that picks up logs from the ground and transports them to a loading area. Traveling through the terrain, it's rough and these machines don't provide the best working conditions. They shake a lot and they wiggle from side to side. So it's, it's quite uh, a heavy task to drive these kind of machines. In fact, many people cannot work as forward operator for their entire careers as it's too physically demanding on the body. So switching to a remote control machine offers numerous benefits. Uh, one of them is to take the driver out of the cabin that greatly improves working conditions because then you can sit behind a desk. Placing the driver outside the machine, well, that el eliminates a lot of strain on the body and also getting rid of the driver in such a vehicle reduces the cost with approximately 25% or more because you don't have to take the driver and all the risks and hazards into calculation. Remote operated forwarders can also optimize logistics by allowing a single operator to control two or more machines sim simultaneously. And there could be several drivers sitting in the same room operating several machines helping each other out. Also, taking the cabin out of the equation means a lighter machine and it reduces environmental impact as it draws less fuel. And it also opens the possibility to run these machines on batteries, making it easier to replace them with EVs. So during the research, uh, Skogforsk tested the remote operation of forwarders in various situations. In this image, Tobias, which is uh, one of the researchers, is operating the machine using a VR headset and a normal game console controller uh, that, that you have for your normal uh, well, game console, basically. And, and during the testing, the, the operator could either use his VR headset or sit in front of a large screen to get an optimal view. The controls they're using in this test, they are identical to those in the machine. So in this image, uh, Tobias is remotely driving the forwarder using the public 5G network. Well, he's sitting in the red building visible on the upper left corner of the leftmost screen in this image. So he's basically sitting behind these windows and controlling the machine using 5G and also getting all the visuals over 5G. So this is like the broadcasting applications we just discussed, but it also adds a layer of being able to control something um, while you're seeing it, so to say. So why would you want to use 5G in this kind of application? I mean, after all, it's a lot of challenges of bringing 5G to the forest. The, these challenges are significant. So one of the key benefits of 5G is its consistency. Uh, consistency in speed, in latency, and coverage. And compared to Wi-Fi, for example, 5G offers more stable latency. 
the 5G concept was built around three core usage scenarios. And two of these are ideal for unmanned vehicles. Both the enhanced mobile broadband and ultra-reliable low latency communications are crucial aspects of 5G in this context. So operating a machine remotely requires consistent latency and high data speeds to ensure smooth and reliable performance. So there are three network scenarios that are beneficial for this kind of application. We can either use a public micro network, aka the operator's network. We can use a private 5G network with a dedicated base station, or we can use a slice of the public macro network or public network. So the first scenario, public 5G network or public 5G macro cell network, we're testing the public network in this scenario. So the problem is that the user's traffic to the machine shares a network with other users uh, simply because it's using a standard SIM card. So normally th this works, but heavy load on the base station will affect the machine's uh, performance and the, the operator's ability to control it. The challenge with a network that is far from the base station is that the relays become very inconsistent, leading to lag, which is problematic when controlling equipment that needs to move quickly. The boom on the forwarder, it, it actually moves quite fast. If you look at the tip of the boom, uh, it, it can reach high speeds. So consistent latency is crucial. The latency cannot go up and down. And uh, as a driver, you learn to co compensate for this, but the lag and, and the latency has to be consistent. Second issue is a rural setting where 5G coverage may be limited or the network may switch between 4G and 5G back and forth. And this further complicates operations. So our second option is to use a private 5G base station. In this image, uh, there is a blue hut in the middle of the, of the image. There is a red machine sitting next to the hut. That's a forwarder. And to the left of this blue building, there is an extractable antenna mast that is basically the 5G antenna and on the machine you can also see the antenna uh, sticking up from basically the the top of the machine so bringing the base station to the forest well the challenge by all means is to bring it uh not only the base station but also the infrastructure into the forest and the forestry industry isn't based on fixed locations it basically switches from month to month or week to week so in Sweden, we can use private spectrum for 5G, but it requires a license. You can apply for a license, but these licenses are tied to the owner of a specific plot, and the force may span several plots. And additionally, these permits can't be issued for short-term use. So the lack of infrastructure in remote forest areas presents a significant challenge to, to overcome if you want to use private 5G. And well, the third option is to use a dedicated slice of the operator's macro network. And once again, the challenge lies in the lack of rural coverage. So what would be the best solution then, considering that 5G is the chosen alternative? I've studied off-road races like the Baja 500, Various methods have been used to ensure reliable communication in remote areas. One of these methods involves using weather balloons to carry base stations or antennas to provide extended radio or communications coverage. In Raleigh, for example, they carry the base stations using helicopters. The weather balloons they are attractive as they can be deployed at high altitudes. They don't uh, cost as much to, to use them. and Using a weather balloon allows the base station to cover large areas and to overcome obstacles such as mountains or valleys. So the question is, could this approach be feasible in our scenario to bring 5G to the forest? I don't know if that was the intention, but Skogforsk successfully tested another approach. They used a more modern approach than a weather balloon. They used a drone to lift the base station above the working area. So in collaboration with one of the operators, they managed to use a 5G network to cover an area of three kilometers in diameter. And the operator of the machine was actually situated 90 kilometers away. 
So you can see in, in this image, you can see the drone on the upper left side. You can see the driver using this VR headset and you can see the machine without any driver in it. So th this was the, the test they, um, they performed together and the, the downsides of using a drone in this application, it would be battery life. Uh, the, the battery will, uh, will drain eventually, but the concept is intriguing. Uh, I also th think this setup could be an excellent solution for temporary networks, even beyond the forestry sector. I can envision its use in scenarios like a disaster recovery, road construction, and similar applications where coverage is crucial in, in rural areas. So th that's all for me. Uh, if you have any questions regarding 5G and hardware, uh, feel free to reach out. And to uh, clarify in this application, we have provided the onboard uh, terminals or the uh, onboard routers that communicates with both the public and private networks. So that's uh, basically my uh, speciality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulf. Impressive articulation. I appreciate that. Let me introduce Ejik and Z Ifuchi from Lagos, Nigeria, to present on 5G and IoT emerging technologies with use cases. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Anesh. It's a pleasure. Can anybody hear me, please? Yes. It's a pleasure being here. And um, so let me share my screen. Sorry, share. Yes. Um. Can you see my screen now, please? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, Kanesh, I appreciate you for having me here, and I'm happy to present to you today. Uh, I would actually be speaking on five G and IoT with emerging use cases. You know, in Africa here, especially Nigeria. We've been doing a lot to actually catch up with the pace of the mobile telephony and um, meet up with the benefits of 5G and its services. So I will be speaking on this on my agenda for today. And I'll be taking it one after the other if time permits me. Now, my name, like you all know here, is EGK Zafuichi. I Telecom brand one consultant. I joined Ericsson as a graduate trainee in Nigeria, and I was part of the team that actually rolled out Enode B. Um, from there, we moved to rolling out 3G, full time 3G, and um, an opportunity came to join Huawei. I, I worked with Huawei as a telecom field run. O and M. We're part of the team that rolled out 3G into rural communities. And I've been with them for 10 years now. So, and now I'm actually a consultant on RAN O and M deployment. So 5G IoT, actually there has, there has been a lot of superlatives thrown around about 5G, up to and including being the most important invention since electricity. Well, um, while that is certainly not true, it is one of the uh, um, hottest topics today. Now, 5G offers a number of significant improvements um, compared to previous mobile generations. You know, IoT began with simple remote monitoring like vending machines and um, most of us are aware of the five, the first generation uh, smart refrigerations. But today, um, 5G has moved to, uh, IoT has moved on to fully connected cars, um, smart grids that span the entire cities, and, and telehealth. Like one of our presenters actually did a good presentation on, on telehealth, uh, on healthcare awareness. So the synergy between 5G and IoT is actually reshaping industries and is enabling communication and data exchange between devices on an unprecedented scale. And um, Africa, especially Nigeria, would not be left behind at this moment in time. Now, 5G operates at various bands. And, and the good thing about 
5G is it can actually operate at these three bands. So depending on the applications that it wants to be operated with. Now, why for the low band, why this is the lowest of the three bands, it provides the widest range of coverage. Low band access is vital, as we are aware, for IoT sensors in agriculture, remote mining sites, and oil feeds, most especially in wind farms. Now, for the mid band, um, this actually operates at six gigahertz range. Mid, being mid band spectrum is popular across enterprises. You know, due to the increasing number of um, availability for private spectrum, which um, we've seen it happening in some developed nations across the world, you know, mid band helps businesses communicate with sensors and devices across the entire campus. You know, by utilizing the emerging 5G LAN technology to support secure access to these private uh, applications. But however, the good news is this, you don't have to pick a single band to operate on. Um, 5G uses all bands, like I said earlier, to communicate, which, uh, um, to communicate with both the wide area network and the local area network. So for this, enterprises choose which bands to operate on based on the reliability requirements for each device far away from its um, cellular infrastructure. Okay, um, markets to, according to market to market analysis, the 5G market is a, is a very huge one. The, uh, the projection between um, 2023 and um, 2028 is huge. The compound and growth rate as seen here is exponential in the next five years um there will be around 59.7 billion dollars worth of um interest from iot's asia pacific is going to be the largest region so far they, they've been doing well in championing iot use cases uh, and applications china mobile leads the chart um at t verizon full on the t-mobile Followed by Vodafone, you can see Africa is yet to catch up. And um, although Ericsson and Huawei has been very helpful so far in trying to ensure that Africa bridges this gap. Now, according to the, the 5G networks, from market to market research, the 5G networks are giving a way to transformative IoT applications for many industries, it's plenty innovative IoT use cases. Now, low latency and expanded networks means that 5G can reach can reach 10 times more devices per square kilometer, though there are still research development ongoing in this aspect. Now, here is a mobility report from Ericsson Business Review, which shows the, the benefits of these in the enterprise and public sector, and also the consumer end of it. Now, a study by Juniper Research disclosed that as consumers of 5G penetration rates become saturated, it, it is very imperative, which most operators have actually moved into. It's very imperative to launch 5G services geared towards IoT users, especially in the 5G advanced and 5G red cap rem. Now the 5G business horizon is expansive and they are driven by technologies like the enhanced mobile broadband, the fixed wireless access and the wide area network. You know, um, in leveraging these business cases as projected by Ericsson, EMBB requires a very high bandwidth to operate. Such cases include the cloud and UHD, 8K video streaming, immersive gaming. And in this immersive gaming includes uh, augmented reality and virtual, reali reali uh, virtual rea reality gaming, video analytics, immersive events experience, and telemedicine. You know, um, this provides hot, for EMBB, this provides ultra ultra-high bandwidth applications, which would make 
especially for hungry applications, essential for high definition streaming and cloud services. This will actually boost productivity and operational efficiency. Now, when you expand into the adjacent profit pools for FW and WW1, these areas target the residential broadband and enterprise segments. Now it represents the value pools of, for service providers with higher average revenue per user as compared to the traditional mobile services. Now, for differentiated connectivity solutions, the arrival of cloud computing caused a revolution, which actually most developed nations are actually penetrating right now in the enterprise IT. So this provides new opportunities for service innovation and performance-based business models. According to Ericsson, this differentiated connectivity with predictive performance is made possible by 5G standalone network capabilities, such as network slicing. Though network slicing comes with its own challenges so far, challenges with them, um, um, which is fraught with technical, regulatory, and market challenges. So, so far, we are yet to actually commercialize network slicing. So going forward with Ericsson's mobility review for 2024, the uh, innovation and ecosystem growth, networks are becoming more programmable. Now, in this programmability, this creates new revenue and cost-saving opportunities for enterprise. As, as time goes on, operators plan to expose network capabilities that will bring developers comprehensive visibility and control over these capabilities. Now, as um, McKinsey and company reports, the estimated profit from 5G IoT in business to business realms is very huge. Thus, the 5G capabilities promises a hundredfold increase in simultaneous connections with speeds 100 times faster and a 90% reduction in power consumption, hereby revolutionizing connectivity across industries. In Africa, we uh, most of the operators here still um, um, roll out 5G NAC. We tend to use the existing 4G infrastructure to allow uh, fallback to areas, especially rural communities, where we don't have um, 4G. And in some cases, I was part of the team with Gilad in 2017 in Lagos, where we rolled out um, VSAT um, um, mobile, with VSAT telecom structure in areas where it is very difficult to install base stations. So such areas in the rural telephony zones in Africa, 5G will, will be very difficult for now to penetrate such areas. So simply put, the synergy between 5G and IoT for areas where it is possible to roll out is an equalizing that shifts across industries. And for this reason, it enhances productivity safety and enabling uh, capabilities in various industrial sectors. So going forward to the advantages of IOTs, which most of our presenters actually elaborated segment by segment, talked about, uh, Professor talked about uh, the areas on which he shared. Um, the last presenter talked about the forestry and gradually uh, the industry would continue to utilize the benefits. Um, um, one of the greatest... Okay, um, okay, sorry. Time is over. Would you mind to yes, say that? I, I, would, I would do that now. Now, the area I would like to conclude because of time is in the area of AIOT. Um, so far, BMW is revolutionizing 5G IoT in its, in its um, business at scale, whereby um, it utilizes, BMW utilizes 5G and IoT technologies in its manufacturing process. So what they do is to optimize production efficiency and quality control by employing 
IoT sensors, and 5G connectivity. Same with Philips. Philips leverages IoT devices and 5G connectivity in medical devices. And finally, Amazon so far utilizes IoT technology in its fulfillment centers to streamline operations and enhance customer experience. So finally, what is the future of 5G and IoT integration with AI? This is an interesting area where an ongoing juxtaposing is currently in place. There is a 5G and AIoT center currently set up by Singapore Polytechnic to assist and enable enterprises adopt 5G and AIoT innovation solutions. This center develops 5G and AIoT applications that achieve ultra low latency, high speed wireless connectivity, centralized real time monitoring, intelligent control and data analysis. Now, what SP does is to actually integrate embedded hardware like sensors and gateways to connections with software cloud platforms. And these developments would actually create a complete end-to-end -end system. Thank you very much. And um, I'll be glad to take questions on this subject area. Thank you. Very well articulated, uh, very well explained. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, GK. Um, now, let me introduce Thomas Akawal from Palacio, Redwood City, USA, to present on 5G APIs in production, experience reducing 10 times implementation time of new services and use cases. Over to you, sir. Hi, Ganesh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Let me share my screen. So uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Tomasa Chavo. I, I started my career working at a service operator. And soon after, I uh, started uh, my own company uh, looking to solve the information silos problem within telecommunications. Today, I am going to present how we expose 5G data so that it's easy to deploy the use cases that you have been talking about. So that third party, third party developers or third party services can be deployed much faster. Also how this uh, data is useful for internal operations, for observability of the network and for a, 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 a automate network operation. I am going to focus not only in 5G, but also 4G, uh, because we see that one of the main challenges uh, in operators is being able to have the legacy networks work together with 5G that is still deploying and, and, and it's taking longer than expected. So um, just as a brief history of what we have done as a company, uh, we started a, as a company working on end-to-end uh, -end observability of multi-vendor networks, uh, 4G and, and, and 2G, 3G, 4G. Then we worked with 5G observability. Every logo that I have here is because they approved us to go publish a blog or something. Then we built a network functions in 5G. And, in, and we started focusing only in 5G. But in all of this path, we we found out is uh, the main one of the main challenges in uh, for operators nowadays is how can I monetize my my five G network? How can I? Be, uh, they're trying to make sense uh, of their investments. So there's a a a, a huge untapped uh, revenue potential here, and it's. How can I deploy new services uh, faster? How can I deploy services beyond communications? How can I enable uh, IoT companies to have more than just the communication, but data like location and other types of data that can come from the network? Uh, that's when we built uh, a solution so that telcos can expose network APIs. 
and uh, as a solution so that developers can easily build uh, solutions based on, on, on these APIs. Uh, in this forum last year, I think you mentioned Camara. Well, Camara is part of these uh, APIs that I'm, I'm talking about. So some of the problems that we are going to talk about are from the operations, uh, late detection of degradation because traditional vendors are exposing data every 15 or 30 minutes. And, 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 and in 5G and, and with these technologies that I'm going to show you, we expose them in real time. In fact, and it takes a long time to implement a new automation use case or monetizable service in 5G. There's vendor locking and data silos problems as well. So this the solution that I'm going to talk to you about is a solution to enable observability, automation, and third-party services. How do we do this? Is we are a turnkey solution that takes care of all the complexities uh, of dealing with the 4G and 5G network data. We normalize this data across vendors, across technologies uh, from 5G that is already standardized to legacy technologies so that all of this can be exposed in a normalized way through an API gateway. And then a low code developer portal that allows you to build your own applications, be them observability, automation for internal use cases, or third party services that uh, need this. I, I will show you examples on how as, uh, one company uh, exposed, exposing this data could deploy a security service uh, that they took into production in six weeks instead of the usual 12 to 14 months that it takes to deploy it. So in these APIs that we are exposing that show you the data in the network, we have a network data APIs that are used for operation. So, uh, user inside APIs like service experience. What is the service experience uh, in each place of the country that we are analyzing? What are the services being consumed in, 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 in each place? Like uh, voice, uh, voice over Wi-Fi, voice over 5G, fixed wireless access or, or whatever. What, are, what is the congestion? Uh, what, is the, um, what is the profile of, of the people around there? And all of this respecting uh, data privacy. And then Camara APIs. Camara is... Uh, uh, it's 34 telcos and the Linux Foundation have standardized how to expose data to the outside world so that developers can build based on this uh, data that comes from 5G. The problem is most operators, it is very challenging to feed these uh, APIs from the southbound. Well, we bring a solution so that you can feed it from the southbound, start exposing these data, and start monetizing the 5G networks in, in new ways beyond connectivity. So here are some real responses. This is, these are solutions that are currently deployed in production. Uh, and this is how it looks uh, for a developer or, or for a person that wants to interact with this data. Uh, one of the challenges that we saw is once we started exposing this data is most people are, even technical people, are do not have enough uh, like software development capability. So we did the integration into a low code drag and drop solution so that you can drag and drop boxes. And the use cases that you have in your head, uh, you can drag these boxes and to interact with the data so that you can build these use cases. Uh, in, in a shorter period of time. We had feedback from a customer uh, that's uh, with which we did a POC and they said, uh, they asked for a use case. We, we, we showed them how to build it. We went with them and we built it in one day, uh, two days. And, and the feedback was, hey, this would have taken us five months to build. And we did it in two days because we had all this data normalized, exposed, and we had this, this tool to drag and drop and to think creatively on how to solve this problem. So uh, with this, uh, I, I want to share what has been our experience 
on how to make the most out of, uh, out of these network APIs uh, within a, an organization. First, we need to work on transforming a company culture using these APIs. And how can we do that? What our experience, and, and I'm sure can be enriched with all the experiences of, of you people here, is first, uh, you can empower operations engineers to build new observability use cases to detect incidents sooner, uh, uh, leveraging the real-time data capabilities of, of, of these APIs. Second, enable AI ops and automation teams to build use cases faster with immediate access to this data. As a second step, expose these APIs to telco vendors so that it can the time it takes to implement a new service can be reduced. And finally, when once you have changed the internal company culture, expose this API to developers in the outside world using Camara APIs. With Wildlab, we can do all of this, and I will show you a couple of use cases in examples, uh, example use cases. All right, this is something sad. So first, we expose data for operational uh, use cases. With this, we reduce the inc incident uh, detection time from 15 minutes to two minutes because we had all multi-vendor network from across the network, from the RAN to the core, all integrated into one solution exposing this data. We have built use cases analyzing the user plane, the control plane, service experience, and correlating metrics, alarms, logs, uh, and across technologies, not only 5G, but also the legacy technologies that are still live out there. And I will show you in detail only one uh, use case that is service experience. How can we understand better understand service experience? And like I'm going to explain service experience that is just one of the APIs. We have all sorts of APIs like location, like uh, quality of data uh, that, that are useful. So first, uh, first we create the data. We correlate data from across the network and we calculate a, a user experience. In this case, uh, I'm going to focus in broadband uh, user experience. Uh, and we take into account latency, jitter, drop, downlink, uplink. Uh, and this allow us to, for example, for external use cases, uh, there's an API that is quality of data. Not all the time you need low latency. For example, you might need it only for gaming. So uh, one of the business models is how can I offer gaming uh, users the capability of buying a differentiated service when they are gaming? And not only we have these uh, this algor algorithms to calculate user experience, we also, once the taco buys it, we share it with them so that uh, we can improve them together with our clients. We have complementary APIs. Uh, not only user experience, but also a complementary API so that they can build the use cases like what sites are congested, uh, what is the user experience per, per user, what are the heavy users, what is the video on demand traffic, etc. And we're able to identify the sites with the worst service experience and uh, uh, automatically you, uh, get to the root cause of these incidents uh, using the other uh, APIs like heavy users and and and, and uh, heavy users congestion uh, video on demand uh, use cases and close the loop so that we can uh, prioritize the traffic so that it, we can really give a good experience. With this, uh, well, I. I, I, I hope you saw, uh, I, I, I'm I trying to expose to you what is the power of exposing data uh, via APIs to enhance the 5G experience and to make it seamless transition between 4G and 5G. Uh, thank you very much.
That was fabulous. Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas. I really appreciate. Uh, I know it's about 2 plus a.m. there from there. And uh, thank you for making your time. I really appreciate it. Let me introduce our last speaker, um, Elena Bascon from Brussels, Belgium, to present on AI and XR, the software and hardware of the metaverse. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let's try to uh, share the slides. Um, I think I need to have access. Wait. You have the access, Elena? Uh, let's see. Okay, yes, I do. And also, thank you so much to Thomas. It was really like um, an honor to, to follow your presentation. I really, really liked it. So can you see um, my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, perfect. So nice to meet you all. I am Elena. I am a Brussels-based uh, policy, uh, pu public policy professional. And I also have two different blogs um, that I founded. And currently I uh, am researching on uh, the metaverse, specifically uh, how the public and the private sector can collaborate efficiently when it comes to uh, innovation, specifically when it comes to the metaverse. In this case, I wanted to touch upon the topic of how artificial intelligence and extended reality um, are basically two sides of the same coin, meaning that they both contribute to create what I call a digital universe that I think is the um, metaverse. So um, this first slide that I got from uh, Alan Smithson on Medium, I think summarizes very well the different components of the metaverse. We have on a side artificial intelligence or AI that has um, different uh, consequences in our daily life. For example, we can use artificial intelligence assistance to ask them questions or to um, ask, for example, very technical um, inquiries, for example, how to code. So we have coding assistance. And then we have uh, extended reality, which I will explain a little bit more um, in detail later. And extended reality uh, comprehends also um, avatars, for example, that this year in 2024, I've seen becoming really high quality and really um, almost person looking, which was really interesting to see. And then we have blockchain. Um, blockchain, from a public policy perspective, I think it's really interesting because um, it touches upon uh, specific areas that are usually uh, government regulated, like cryptocurrency. So finance, but also smart contracts, for example. And this is a, an innovation that I'm really interested and excited about in a way. And I want to see more developments on this. And all of these components um, intertwined get to create something that we call metaverse. Of course, um, not referring to any specific company, but to refer to a concept that can also be um, called virtual worlds, for example, to use more of a bureaucratic, bureaucratic language. Also, omniverse can also be a term, but in general, metaverse is a more widespread term um, used to indicate a concept of um, a digital universe that we can, can immerse our, ourselves in. Right now, we have um, a digital world that we enter um, thanks to 2D uh, devices and the metaverse it's um a world that we can handle with 3d devices and devices that are also wearable so um let's see a little bit more what i mean when i say that there is a, a software and a hardware side so to answer this this question i looked into um the um encyclopedia britannica online and to see a little bit um what um definition they gave of software and hardware, as I was a bit curious. And they said that a software is the instructions that um, tell a computer what to do. And hardware is um, a computer machinery and equipment, including memory, cabling, power supply, peripheral devices, and circuit boards. So I think that these definitions are quite interesting because they show us um, how software is really about inputs and um, and it's more about what kind of um, 
it's more almost like um, the mind of the computer, while the hardware is more like the um, the arm of the computer, we could say like the, um, and if we continue like the metaphor of a universe, I would say that um, artificial intelligence, it's almost like the pilot of a shuttle and extended reality and the extended reality industry um, with the devices that it, it produces, it's like the shuttle that is being taken by the pilot to a new uh, universe. So um, let's review a little bit more um, in detail the concept of extended reality. So extended reality is really an umbrella term um, that um, covers three different um, concepts. So the first one is um, augmented reality. And when we think about uh, augmented reality, uh, we can think of applications that are also available on 2D devices. And for example, in my case, I also always think of um, those kind of applications that you can use to look at yourself in different ways, like filters, um, facial filters, or um, filters that you apply on on pictures as you're trying to um, to photograph like a landscape. That's augmented reality. Uh, mixed reality. I think it has very interesting and and useful applications um, when it comes, for example, to health, because it allows, uh, for example, right now doctors to see. Um, reality in a um in a way that is not so immersive so they are able to see parts of the human body in a way that it's uh for example enlarged and then they can perform medical tests in a much more efficient way but without uh wearing um a full-on headset which is the case of virtual reality where you are you're actually wearing a headset so you're fully immersed in another world. What we have been seeing in the past months, however, is the developments of headsets, um, not glasses, but really headsets that are, are, are not so fully immersive, that still allow you to um, see reality to some degree. Um, all of these three examples together and three concepts together contribute to creating what we call extended reality or X reality, because um, X is also the, um, the variable that can be used to indicate something that it's um, that is uh, really unknown. So it could be augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality, any kind of re um, any kind of product that takes you to um, that empowers you outside of your reality is X reality or extended reality, um, and. If you are being empowered to see the world in a way that it's um, is um, extended in some way, um, I think you're already entering a digital universe. You're you're already entering the metaverse to some degree, even though it's um, it's a world, it's a digital world that we're still building um, as as innovators. Um, so we have, of course, a picture here of a woman with a headset, so with a virtual reality headset. And when it comes to the artificial intelligence side of things instead, um, one could say that this aspect has instead boomed this year. So there is a lot of, of talking um, in this case. But I think what hasn't been really covered so far is the fact that um, artificial, real, artificial intelligence is really... Um, the ability of a computer to perform very complex ta uh, tasks. So tasks that so far as have been usually associated with humans that give inputs to the computer. And right now we have instead the computer itself that is able to perform um, a large set of tasks um, without the, any input from a programmer, for example. Um, or without too much of a human supervision, which is very interesting, especially when it comes to generative AI that allows to create, for example, um, avatars in um, in extended reality and and metaverse. So what I I think it's um, it's important to highlight, and I haven't seen being covered, especially in the uh, public policy sector this year, but I would say in any sector. Um, 
is the fact that artificial intelligence, yes, it's something that is rising right now, and then it has so many difficult different implications. You can use it um, as a tool, uh, like as as an educational tool. It can be used um, as a computing tool in many different uh, industry or for the development of um, of chatbots and assistants and um, many other type of products, but mainly what's going to happen in the future is going to be that artificial intelligence will allow for a faster and more efficient development of a 3D immersive reality, um, like the metaverse, because it will allow to create um, what we're already seeing, like almost person looking avatars, which that require um, a very complex uh, amount of uh, inputs given to the computer, for example, which without artificial intelligence wouldn't be able to, um, wouldn't be possible to have, for example. So the rise of artificial intelligence plays perfectly with the rise of extended reality and the creation of the metaverse. But unfortunately, so far, we haven't seen too many people covering this link, which is strategic on in the long term with the rise of the metaverse and i really think that especially when it comes to governance and um i will go to the next slide but before um doing so i wanted to put like a small robert here because i use uh, artificial intelligence assistance myself for example to code and i always picture them as like this small robots assistants that also help me in my everyday life and i think they are they are the same in the case of extended reality they are basically the the mind of the computer as i said that tell the computer what to do um so going to this last slide actually my my main point for today is that if we start envisioning um, artificial intelligence and extended reality as two sides of the same coin that together with other um innovation that I said I'm very curious to see um, being developed and rising in the next years, especially in the field of blockchain. What we're going to have is a completely new world in the digital sector. And I think this, this is something that many innovators are already realizing, they're already seeing. It was very um, useful for me today to hear more about standardization process, to hear more about um, also the efforts made to connect more remote areas um, because I think it's going to be a very central topic to um, to include certain parts of the population through 5G connection, for example, because of course the metaverse is not going to, uh, to succeed if there isn't um, fast and efficient connection um, almost everywhere. Um, or it's going to it's going to happen that the metaverse is just um, it will remain a very niche um, place where just a few elected people will be able to go. Um, but what I really think is that this this idea that um, we're we're heading towards um, a place that it's um, the intersection of many new technologies and many new innovations. It's something that needs to um, to highlight it to policymakers as well. Otherwise, the um, the risk is that new technologies, for example, AI, as we saw this year in Brussels, will be regulated separately, and there will be a lack of coordination when it comes to um, the regulation of artificial intelligence, extended um, reality, blockchain technologies, and we will head to this new world with uh, um, with a, an, an, an uncoordinated um, regulation to all the, the components that are, um, make this um, this new world, which will make it much more complicated this uh, this new universe to navigate and it will create um, a lot of more challenges in the future. In general governance has to be, um, able to see the macro challenges for the future and the micro challenges. And my main worry right now is that we're being too sectorial and we're just seeing the, the pieces of the puzzle and not the entire puzzle. And um, I think it's time to see all of, how all of these components play together in order to have effective and high quality governance. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Elena. That was fabulous. Fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate that. So, uh, yeah, we are towards the end and uh, let's have a quick 10 minutes or more uh, Q&A session among all the speakers. Um, if you can uh, switch on your camera, that will be very fully appreciated. Um, uh, we all know that um, today's industry is moving rapidly. Uh, uh, the way uh, uh, the industries are moving towards the uh, artificial intelligence, AI, uh, generative AI, a lot of uh, technology vendors, uh, mobile network operators, and also the other enterprise uh, organizations have really have put in a lot of R&D uh, to improvise uh, the organization in terms of uh, uh, operational excellency, uh, reduce the uh, uh, any downtime and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so given the rapid advancements in AI and network technologies, what do you see as the most exciting developments um, or challenges on the horizon of AI-enabled networks? Anyone wants to take this up? Oh, okay. Um, thank you, Kanesh. Can anyone hear me? Yes, okay. Okay. Um, well, um, AI, I was speaking um, from the perspective of Africa, where I come from, especially Nigeria. Um, AI is very exciting, especially for us in Africa, because there is a gap technologically between developed nations and the third world. But AI, is exciting because it's going to help us bridge that challenge faster or bridge that gap, especially in mobile networks. Now, let me give a brief definition of AI from the European Commission. And I, I really prefer this definition because of our peculiar nature. Now, according to European Commission, artificial intelligence is a software. AI systems are software and probably also hardware systems designed by humans that given a complex goal, act in the physical or digital dimension by perceiving the environment through data acquisition, interpreting the collected structured or unstructured data, data reasoning on the basis of knowledge or processing information derived from this data and deciding the best actions to take to achieve this goal. Now, my, my take home point here because of our challenges in rural Africa is physical or digital dimension by perceiving the environment through data acquisitions. Now, AIT refers to technology that can perform tasks that require a certain level of intelligence. Now, a hard to get area in Africa where there is poor medical attention, uh, low yield in agricultural output and um, communication for rescue in case of any emergency. Now, AI helps Africa to achieve this within a such short period of time. Now, now, because of the widespread adoption of mobile technologies in Africa, there is optimism that AI technologies will be the next wave of technology to receive wide acceptance. Especially, I will appreciate Ericsson and Huawei and Nokia because the two major operators in Nigeria makes um, does uh, uh, an MS agreement with these three vendors, and they've been very helpful in pushing AI in mobile technologies. The leader so far in Africa is South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Ghana. So with this widespread adoption of AI applications. In Africa, there are still challenges. You know, the, the crucial factors needed for technology adoption are seriously lacking in Africa. Many countries in Africa are still lacking the necessary infrastructure, the governance, the data ecosystem, STEM education, and other factors necessary for AI. But these three countries in Africa, like I mentioned earlier, South Africa, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Ghana, are gradually adopting AI with the help of uh, Huawei and Ericsson to help in agricultural yields, um, uh, telemedicine, 
especially in the area of you know using drones to get to hard to reach areas and give us live feed of the, the conditions of of, of uh, mothers about to give birth and uh, most especially in, in um, um, inspections or bacteria or diseases being spread like as we speak currently there is an mpox um, disease uh, uh, gradually spreading so the Nigerian Medical Association, Association in Nigeria has actually been making effort to integrate IAI in distributing these vaccines with the help of the, the World Health Organizations. So AI to Africa is a good thing for us. Despite the challenges, we'll keep making um, adoption possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ejiki. Anyone else wants to take it up? Yes, I also have an idea. Uh, since I was describing IoT applications earlier, just uh, looking forward to, to the future of 6G networks and maybe even further, I believe that AI will be a key enabler for the next generation aerospace communication. Like how data is transmitted, processed, optimized in aerospace research, particularly in space exploration, and maybe satellite communication as well, creating smarter satellites, spacecrafts that can communicate autonomously, make real-time adjustments to the signal strength and ensure efficient data transmission towards Earth. That would be, I believe this would be uh, opening new possibilities for uh, space exploration. And it's also one of my interests. I just wanted to add something. Uh... AI is very much used uh, into the personalized customer experience, uh, be it in the mobile network operators or even the OTT players. I've seen um, uh, like Netflix, uh, Disney World, and uh, uh, and partnership together with T-Mobile and AT&T and, and uh, NVIDIA as well. Uh, by having this kind of uh, new innovation of uh, customized uh, content, uh, content, because if you, we, we, we are aware that uh, there's millions of videos are generated on a daily basis and they try to use the AI to improvise the quality of those videos. Uh, streaming is another thing where the AI takes a lot of uh, involvement. Um, also in terms of the uh, uh, infotainment in the vehicles because uh, in the future most of the vehicles are very much like EV oriented vehicles and how these infotainments with AI enabled uh, are being uh, installed uh, with the partnership of the mobile operators. Uh, this is some of the examples that I can foresee. Anyone wants to take? Uh, I wanted to yes. add... Oh, sorry, you go for it, sorry. Yeah, I, I was unsure if I was going to um, clash. Thank you so much. No, I just wanted to add on the previous two because I am really um, excited to see more AR, um, VR training in the next months and even years. And I think based on the answers that have just been given, I think it's going to be very useful for many industries, also aerospace, aviation, and uh, with a better uh, generative AI, there's going to be a higher quality as well. Um, also with better connectivity. And I think this is going to be um, very important, especially for, um, for health and education, at least these are the two sectors that for me are the most exciting to look at. Okay, then I if, if I may continue, I a uh, few few points. I I believe AI is is definitely something that that will be like beneficial and and bring benefits to various sectors, but then also also seeing seeing the costs uh, of that and the, and the threats so for, first on the on the like what it takes so i mean if 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 now data uh, they are they and already are and will be even more like uh, intelligent uh end nodes or sensors that that collect data and despite that that the thing is that we go to more decentralized uh, architecture so but anyway the amount of data processing is is needed uh, for ai whatever data is uh, processed with ai or um, machine learning or or whatever methods that that will uh, 
as and now I'm coming from from electrical engineering and energy sector, so that will uh, require more uh, energy consumption uh, and generate more energy consumption. So the question is that where that is produced. So do we continue heating the globe, uh, doing the lot of lot of uh, lot of like data processing all over the places? So the question is how what is the source of energy uh, you use uh, for the power demands and energy consumption? So that's the key thing. And then the other thing also. Uh, having been there looking at the uh, like energy vertical and critical infrastructure. So when, when we have like uh, dozens of millions of nodes collecting data and we providing inputs to, to uh, decision making, for instance, how do you run the power system? And then, then the cybersecurity issues arise that, that how you can trust that the data you are making the decisions based on is real data and not already manipulated data in some 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 wrong purpose. So there are a lot of threats also I'm I'm seeing here, not not just positive things. So but I but of course this is we can we can continue continue the uh, discussion on this topic so forever. So I, I I will now end my speech. So thank you. Uh, I have to agree with you, Prof, because uh, I think security is a, is a non-stop kind of issue, right? Because every single day, there's a new innovation that's happening and there's always uh, uh, new ideas to how to, you know, uh, uh, what they call rob through the IT information. Uh, and uh, there's always a group who always try to bust the, the ghost busters. So, so it's an ongoing thing. Uh, and... Uh, and definitely, it's a major threat uh, uh, when it comes to the innovation of AI uh, on the security aspect. Yeah, I, I like to add also um, because we, uh, I serve B two B market, and usually B two B market need assurance, need SLA. So if we use AI to do all the work, and then they uh, we produce the SLA report, for example. Will the enterprise believe this SLA is done by AI, or is being manipulated by um, how to say the 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 data to trust the data that has been collected? So even though we produce proof, it's ninety nine point nine nine, but the industry the business say that we still don't want to adopt it yet. We'll still wait and see. So that's what we, we have seen, even though we have SLA report, it's still not convinced that AI is here to help us. Yeah. Okay, Um. let me just add to this. Apart from network security, I believe um, interoperability is also a challenge. Um, IoT devices comes from various manufacturers, and um, and they operate on, on different platforms, you know, ensuring seamless communication and integration among these devices over a 5G network is very complex. So uh, I believe one of the solutions could be developing and adopting, you know, industry-wide standards and frameworks that can um, facilitate interoperability. And um, another challenge, finally, is scalability. You know, the massive number of IoT devices expected to connect to 5G networks require a robust infrastructure to manage, to manage data traffic and also ensure consistent performance. So existing infrastructure might not be sufficient to handle the surge in these connecting devices. So investing in upgrading current network infrastructure to support higher data throughput and also increased device connections would be essential you know, in implementing edge computing Thank you very much. I think this is all I have for now. I think interoperability issues uh, comes mainly because of um, um, there's there's more than 150 open brand or open core supplies, right? Uh, compared to the major big boys like Ericsson, Nokia, Huawei, now we see more players are coming in so that we can diversify the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, but then true. you have much more different components and the interoperability exactly. of those components also exactly. can be a challenge as well, right? 
So that's quite interesting. Um, just one last thing. I was actually just reading on this this morning, and there was this survey that was done with uh, some of the biggest telcos, and the question was whether they would, what do they foresee generative AI specifically being used for the most, and where will, where do they think that uh, generative AI will have the maximum impact, and network optimization and network service assurance were the two main categories that they foresee where generative AI will be used the most. Uh, I think the category that they were not most confident about was network planning, because they still think that it, the, mod, the models are not mature enough to handle that, especially for the kind of mature networks that some of the biggest telcos have. But the other challenge would be not all telcos are really techcos and if managing data quality is something that they will need to sort of, yeah, start building their organization around managing data quality and governance, right? Because if it's garbage in, garbage out, right? So just like, um, I think one of the, uh, I think was it Razman who was saying that the B2B customers wouldn't probably even trust the data that is being presented to them. And it would definitely depend on the kind of data that is going in that, whatever it is, whether it's a large language model or any other model that is being used. So I guess that is one of the challenges that some of the telcos would have to face in going forward with AI-enabled networks. When you say the uh, network optimization, definitely is part of the managed services, right? And managed services contract is what Rasman sees. Uh, the SLAs and everything. And um, uh, I remember, you know, uh, while I was in, uh, many, many years back with Ericsson and how we deal with the mobile network operators, um, the, the customer, the client always would be pressing on the KPIs. <laughs> and, you know, they have like a long list of KPIs and you go to, you know, improvise year by year. And obviously we can foresee that, you know, today, you know, AI is the one that's going to help you know, uh, to improvise those KPIs. So, so yeah, it's interesting. I wanted to add just one thing. I just really think that um, it's a bit difficult to foresee um, how technology is going to be used like massively um, as long as it's being used by a a small or just a part of the population. I really think that the kind of foresight that you can have are always going to be skewed in a way as long as there isn't like mass inclusion and mass, mass adoption. So I'm really curious to see this because I really think that we might not really be able to have, a, have the correct idea of what's going to happen with AI or with extended reality or any other type of innovation, as long as we don't push inclusion forward at the same time, like the data is always going to be mm, not like incorrect, but always like just from a very small part of the population. Wolf, uh, you want to say something? Well, AI and uh, specifically IoT is very interesting, I think. And um, what I'm struggling with is where to, in a device uh, system, where do, where do we use AI? Should we use AI on the devices and make decisions uh, in the edges of the network? Or should we trust on AI resources in the cloud? So should we, uh, should we just send data and AI process it? it and and then reacts back to the device or or should we try to implement it in the device saving the load of, of sending data to to server and also the energy of the server processing the data and the energy going back again so that's um uh, I, I i would love to see more of the ai enabled devices in the future like sensors routers and, and so on I think that is technology that is coming very fast. That's a great yes. point that you have uh, highlighted, Wolf, because uh, uh, like uh, uh, one week ago, uh, Michael Dell, the owner of Dell Technologies, 
have mentioned that uh, with the survey uh, of an organization that they have shown more than 83% of uh, the clients are not really uh, uh, mm -hmm. comfortable or, or safe with the public cloud. And most mm -hmm. of them prefer to have a private, uh, private. Uh, storage, right? So, so that is like a really, uh, uh, it, it was a shocking for me because uh, the, the the amount of hyperscalers have have hyped and and so many. We I, I was thinking that a lot of uh, enterprise clients are moving towards the public cloud, but uh, unfortunately, from the survey report, says that is still not yet right. So um, Qualcomm has been spending a lot of time on AI on devices, and I think that is something um, we can foresee. Uh, the strength in the mobile devices plus the laptops as well uh, to have much more better security and uh, within the private storage. Yeah, Kanesh, mm. I, I tend to agree with Oof actually because I would actually prefer to see a situation where the data processing should be closer to the IoT devices. You know, th this reduces the burden on central networks actually and um, goes further to enhance scalability. So they should uh, the development should be get towards uh, uh, the IoT devices, making making private networks more more secure uh, and safer. Yeah. Anyone wants to have a last say? If not, uh, I really appreciate. Thank you so much. I think this is the longest ever. <laughs> of uh, uh &A, and i really appreciate so much uh, your present uh thank you so much i'm so grateful to all of you uh, thank you for your time this video will be uploaded on our youtube channel in the next couple of hours and we will notify to all the speakers and uh, we will promote uh, each of the speaker uh, in our global 5g mission linkedin page in the coming weeks and also in our newsletter uh, so i will be uh, notifying in email uh, uh, sooner uh, to the audience, please subscribe our YouTube channel. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye. bye.